Perfect. Great. Okay, welcome everyone. I am calling to order the June 6th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Yes, and it's uh, 3.04. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna make sure everybody can be heard and can hear us. Um, Hala, one more time, um, would you let us know that you can hear us and make sure we can hear you? Lord confirming. Great. Dr. Shabazz? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> we can hear you. And you can hear us? Yes, I do. Okay, Yvonne? Yes, I can hear you and I hope you can hear me. Can hear you, yeah. And also um, Anika. Yes, I can hear you. All right, great. And Jennifer, you can hear us as well. Okay. All right. So we are going to begin. Um, let me quickly just review our agenda for today, and then we're going to jump right into Juneteenth. So we're going to start um, with Juneteenth, and we have Councillor Lopes joining us to talk about the Heritage Walk, and very excited about that. Um, and then we are going to spend sort of as much time as we need on the designating cannabis tax revenue for reparations. And then we have some conversation uh, related to the mass humanities application, our community engagement plan, and um, also an update on our vacancy position. I also wanted to briefly give us an update and maybe um, someone else on the assembly will also want to do this, including Dr. Shabazz, to talk about where HR 40 is right now, but we'll wait to do that um, toward the end of the meeting. So um, we are gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to Anika in a second. And just before I do, I'm going to say that uh, Juneteenth weekend is happening in full force in Amherst this year. Once again, it's really fantastic. Um, there are two days of events planned um, starting on Saturday. Actually, I think it may even start on Friday somewhere, who knows, but I know Saturday and Sunday, there are lots of events um, happening. And so Anika has been organizing uh, the Heritage Walk that she's going to talk about um, that's happening on Saturday. And then I was hoping that Jennifer could speak to what is happening in the town on Sunday. And then we'll talk about how the AHRA can be of support to both of these um, great days that are planned. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Anika, and I'm also going to share my screen so that folks can see what we're talking about while Anika is speaking. Thank you, Michelle. Uh oh, <laughs> sorry, Jennifer. I that was me. Um, I, I won't touch that again. All right, go ahead, Anika. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Well, thank you all again uh, for inviting me to uh, share this information with you. Uh, so, uh, the Juneteenth Heritage Walking Tour will be on Saturday, June 18th, starting at 11 a.m. This will be the first descendant-led and, cur and curated walking tour celebrating the first Black and Afro-Indigenous families of Amherst, some of whom bridge our town to the military actions that ended slavery in America. Um, this will be an experience-based tour uh, with brief walking in between epic and previously unrecognized Black historic landmarks. Uh, this um, stems from last year's events, where, uh, which was a collaboration between the Civil War Tablet Committee, uh, the Town of Amherst, and the, the Mill District, which where the uh, Civil War Tablet served as the nucleus for that event. 
So where the tour, the tour takes off with the footsteps, through the footsteps of those folks and um, coming up through uh, their descendants. Um, and this is uh, very near and dear to my heart. We will start at the West Cemetery where the African-American section is basically my entire family. So I feel very honored to, uh, for us to begin there where we, we will have talks, the celebration, we will have the Peter Brace Brigade, which are the 54th uh, reenactors with us throughout this tour. Uh, we will move from West Cemetery to the Emily Dickinson Museum, where there will be conversation and music. Music, uh, in particular, music and arts and is uh, entrepreneurship is really such a theme throughout this event. Um, a lot of the folks that we're celebrating have been like the, the lesser known. Uh, folks in Amherst. Um, these were the artists, the entrepreneurs, the bakers, the designers um, of the lesser known. Uh, and so this will also be a first uh, for the Emily Dickinson uh, Museum as well. Uh, we will move on uh, to the Amherst History Museum and another first that there will be um, exhibits that are curated between uh, Ancestral Bridges, which is a nonprofit that will be announced in the tour, and also collaborating with artist uh, Shirley Jackson Whitaker. So we will be fusing uh, that exhibit, which will come forward um, through a, a campaign uh, that is established by Shirley Jackson, Jackson Whitaker called Tote to Vote, which addresses uh, voter suppression, um, primarily with the, within the African American community. Uh, so there will also be lunch there, and that will, you know, be celebratory for all uh, to walk through experiences, exhibits. Uh, the, the Peter Brace Brigade will be camped out in the front lawn there as well. Uh, we will move on uh, to uh, brief stops at the two uh, oldest Black historic churches, which were also which uh, were established by the families that we're talking about. And so we will stop at the Hope Church, which will have some art exhibits um, as well as music. And then we will be having a brief but impactful stop for folks to see the Goodwin Church. <clears throat> that stop, um, just to point out on um, this here, this graphic, it looks like that's an extended top, uh, stop. That's a very brief stop. At, at that point, folks will be invited to come back to the History Museum if they like, just to uh, revisit the exhibits, continue with food and music. And the tour will go on to uh, the Drake, uh, where there will be you know, more music and spirits of people um, desire. Uh, there will be transportation provided for uh, folks who are unable to walk or for whatever other reason do not want to walk. And also due to the length, uh, we encourage and hope that people would join the full duration of the tour, but you're also welcome to join in at specific stops uh, of interest. Uh, I think that in a nutshell, covers uh, the tour. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and I wanna give assembly members an opportunity to ask any questions they might have, Anika, about the day or the tour. And then we will talk uh, a little bit as an assembly about how the AHRA may be able to support the walk. Anika and I had an opportunity to throw around um, some ideas, and so we'll talk about that as well. But let's first see if there are any questions for Anika, um, and I will pause now to please raise your hand if you have any questions or just comments. Yeah, Yvonne. Yeah, I, 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 you know, having lived here a long time, I have to say that I, I'm really happy to see the stops on the tour and that this is like going to be a really great event. So thank you for what you've been able to put together, you know, with information that's not readily known, you know, around town. So I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just actually the other day um, took another walk. It's like kind of revisiting childhood and um, 
And I you know, purposely revisited going from Amity Street to Snell to Hazel, which was a, a walk that I pretty much did on a regular, Neil Jelly growing up and um, you know, just revisiting the streets, of course, that it looks it looks a lot different now, but just remembering the time when it would literally like I'd be dragged along, but it would probably take a good hour or two just to get up the street because it was like all family and my grandmother would be making the, the rounds and it would just it would take forever to uh, to go. So it's it's um it's surreal, uh, but I am I feel so honored to to be a part of this and, you know, so, so thankful for uh, you all and and your su support with it too. So thank you. Thank you, Anika. Would anyone else like to ask Anika a question or make a comment? Dr. Shabazz, were you about to say something? Well, I was waiting for the follow up. You mentioned you all have been discussing ways the AHRA could support. Sure. Um, I definitely am up for that. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, one of the ways that we discussed um, that the AHRA could be of support, and of course, depending on people's schedules and who is available to be there, there may be some assembly members that can be there for the entire period. There may be assembly members who can only be there for periods of time. Um, but one of the ways that we talked about supporting is being um, a sponsor for the walk and doing that through focusing on the meal that's going to be shared uh, with the, the folks in attendance at the museum. And so we, uh, Anika and I have talked about some ideas on who might uh, be able to provide that meal. It is, I think, Anika, you said that it's going to be sort of a sit down type of meal or is it how would you best describe it well i'd like to describe it as like a family cookout so to speak because how i think about these as though they're my direct ancestors i think for all of us especially of uh of black heritage they are everyone's ancestors you know they um they definitely made their sacrifice for us all so i'd love to have uh, that feel um where the history museum is so important as this is what number one will be uh the first time that black people have really come in the door so to speak and you know we're setting the tone create creating this exhibit um this is is not led or talked through through the um the historical society at all um and i think really just taking that space uh, would be so important. Also, another strong connection is Shirley Jackson Whitaker's The Tote to Vote campaign, which really stems through uh, a, an enslaved woman in South Carolina in the late um, 1850s who found out with about, I don't know, it could have been 24-hour notice that she and her daughter would be sold. Uh, slave auction the next day. And at quick thinking, she made um, a, a sack, but it was a tote, and tote is a word that comes from what West African language meaning to carry. And she put some nourishment in there, a little bit of food. She put a lock of her hair um, and some other information. It, well, and it served really as an ancestral link. Um, it carried through this this sack, I think, is now in the Smithsonian today, and it traveled with her daughter Ashley throughout many generations and so the tote tote comes from there it also comes from uh tignon laws which were um late 1700s out of colonial louisiana which required women black women to cover their heads to mark them as members of the slave class so we have kind of merge as we do often as black people where we took those dusty rags and turn them into beautiful hat coverings. And this goes on to the beautiful hats that you see too today, you know, especially within churches. So um, really just how when we are faced with difficulty, we next level it um, and we come together. So this campaign with a tote to vote, it, these totes will have nourishment within them, they will have fans that will give voters education on, you know, are they registered, how, um, what to do if you're not. Um, 
And they also will double as a fan to keep people uh, cool. Um, because we know some of these laws, especially I think it's SB202 in Georgia has made it illegal um, to give voters water while they're in line. So, you know, these totes are really a way for us all to signify like we're here with you. You know, we might not be there with you in physical presence, but, you know, we're, we're really there with you. So I think that, you know, really this location to really, you know, show up and, and be together and enjoy as if it is uh, a family cookout uh, would be most impactful, um, though I hope that you all will be wherever and, um, and it would be nice to know when you know maybe how many of you um, will attend so we can, we'd like to make sure of that, you know, we can arrange and accommodate that within, um, with, for seating as well, um, how the West Cemetery is set up. Well, I'm certainly RSVP now or uh, in whatever, <laughs> whatever other fashion I might do so. I think you're already RSVP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good. Um, well, that's really, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that and for including us in this really important day. Um, and it, it sounds really, really wonderful. Um, and I think one of the things uh, Anik and I had the opportunity yesterday to go to the, um, a pride event that was happening here in the mill district where Hazel's was providing an amazing brunch. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the catfish. Um, <laughs> Um, and it was just so delicious. Um, and so of course, as, um, the maybe only black owned restaurant in Amherst, we feel that it would make great sense to talk to Hazel's about, um, their, their participation in this. And so that's something I was going to lean on you, Dr. Shabazz, to maybe, um, help me with a conversation there, um, given your, okay, great. And um, of course, we can we can talk about some other ideas. I think one of the things, and I don't want Anika to have to stay. We have a big council meeting tonight, so we're all <laughs> um, trying to prepare. But I think um, I could be in touch with Anika after we've had a chance as an assembly to talk a little bit more about this. I also want to hear um, from Jennifer about what's happening on Sunday and how we might be able to support and be engaged in Sunday's events. So um, thank you so much, Anika. Thank you for being here. And uh, we will be back in touch with you in the next couple of days to kind of let you know what we have a chance to discuss here. Okay, all right. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. So Jennifer, would you be able to give us a, a bit of an overview of what's happening on Sunday? Are you sure. prepared to do that right now? Okay, great. Well, Thank you. I, I've only been doing scheduling it for like the last for a very <laughs> long time. So I think I can. So, uh, you know, Sunday's event is um, a cel celebratory event more. So we will start off on the common with the reading of the proclamation from the council and Mindy Dom will come and read a proclamation for us. We'll have the typical bell ringing ceremony um, and we'll have a libation service. And then we have a day full of performers and artists and DJs and craft vendors and food vendors. So the day will be very exciting. Um, we have DJ Rec, we have DJ Trends, we have DJ Cancer, we have Wolfa coming in, we've got, I mean, uh, an Amy Salmon who last year was all over the cover for everything related to Juneteenth on the Common. She'll be there. Um, we have um, Amina Men, uh, tour, oh, I'm so sorry, wrong Amina. Amina will be performing in Juneteenth as well. So that's really um, special. Dr. Um, Carly Tartikoff will read a poem, I believe. And so we just have a lot, a day full of, um, you know, we'll have the, the musician, the black magician, JB, the black musician will come back, magician. I was trying to get there's these dancing horses and I was been trying to get them, but I think that they're booked. We have a lot of newer, uh, um, 
folks who are going to be attending. So we have a um, poetry slam group that just started up at the high school. So they'll be att in attendance and um, performing. And we have two new, well, they're not new, but two younger artists that will be performing as well. So very exciting, lots of performances, lots of food, lots of craft vendors, so. This is for Sunday? This is for Sunday and we'll be celebrating Father's Day too as well. Yes, that's right. So is does this live somewhere? Is there a flyer or a place yeah, where it lists? There's a joint flyer for Juneteenth weekend on the town website. I'm going to bring that up real quick. I think I sent it. Um, is this the one that you mean? Oh, wait, I didn't share yet. Hang on. <laughs> um, let me share. Hi, Alexis. <laughs> is that the one that you mean, um, Jennifer? Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's no list on it, though. So just go to the oh, website. Yeah, you know, I, so I don't I, you know, I didn't do that last year and I'm always caught between it because it's like an element of surprise, but I will be sending out over the next two weeks, the different artists kind of in different announcements for the event. So you guys are probably the first group that I've been so vocal about who's participating. Thank you for the sneak preview. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so if AHRA members are available to attend, my suggestion would be that you get out and speak with the Black community and kind of make that connection. So as I've been hosting other events, you know, Crest has been going to the apartment complexes and I've been talking to people. People just don't know that we're working on reparations. People don't know about the Crest program. And so these are the people who we're, we're doing all of this for. And so they just need to be... They just need to know. So I think the most important thing would be to connect with folks who, I mean, that was the nice, that's the nice thing about the Jubilees. You get people dancing who you don't necessarily see next to each other or, or and so if you can, while you're, you're dancing next to someone, please have the conversation or open up the dialogue for uh, reparations for the community. Absolutely. And do you see um, any, so I know on Saturday at the walk, um, AHRA will be a sponsor and hopefully be able to provide the meal um, and we'll have an opportunity to make some comments. I'm wondering if you see an opportunity, Jennifer, on Sunday, and I don't know exactly what the setup will be, but um, for there to be a table with some materials or are tables not really quite the thing that happens? Or is there some way that we might be able to have some materials available on Sunday, um, just like a little postcard perhaps that we could make? Absolutely. And I'm happy to just pass them around if that's, <laughs> you know, um, but if it would you, if you would think about an opportunity like that, that would be really great. Yeah, I was thinking there's a couple of things. If AHRA members are there, you know, of at least a quorum amount, well, I'd hate to say that, at least three, right? Then we could have the DJs make announcements that the AHRA is here, and then we will have the, um, the DJs announce periodically that there's a table over there for information on reparations. Um, so you guys will probably be the only folks that are going to table, but it would make sense for you guys to table. So awesome. Awesome. And we can work on getting something like a nice little postcard put together, some information. Uh, I want to stop and welcome Alexis and uh, make sure that you can hear us and we can hear you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry you missed Councillor Lopes. We just talked about the walk on Saturday. And um, so maybe when the recording is available, you could listen. I think you'd really uh -huh appreciate the comments that were made in that discussion. Um, so, uh, and I'll catch you up offline about what we're thinking about that. Um, yes, Jennifer. I, I just wanna say quickly, Alexis, so CSSJC I'm sending for you guys to post on your website. Can, we, can I send you the AHRA recordings afterwards? And then you can just post those on your website equally. It is, there's no, there's no air on in here today. And, oh. About to. And Michelle stepped away. Dr. Shabazz, were you going to say something? I just was going to ask Alexis if you've heard if any producer was looking to uh, uh, videotape any of the Heritage Walk. 
Oops. Um, yeah, so I'm absolutely going to be covering that. Um, that's why I can't be there to speak at, in it because I'm going to be on the, behind the camera, but um, I will not be covering the Jubilee on Sunday, so I will definitely be able to attend it like a regular member. Great. Great. That's great. Is somebody going to be... Um... Is somebody going to be covering Sunday's event video wise? Do we know? No. The only thing, so I, I did cover last year's, but because it's like sort of a celebration, there's no real like, I don't know, it was a lot more like free flowing rather than like where like someone is up somewhere speaking at something. Um, so I definitely have footage to be able to, like if someone is intending on promoting this year's Jubilee, um, that can definitely be done with the footage that we took of last year's. Um, but just based off of how it went last year, I can't really like make a program out of like the Jubilee just because it's like something that's just sort of happening as a free flowing thing. Um, so we weren't intending on doing that, but if anybody wants to do that, great <laughs> okay good um great i this i wasn't going to bring this up but i'm going to bring it up because it came to my attention um about the word the use of the word jubilee and i am not uh i don't have as much awareness as probably you all might about that but um there was a black resident who um, felt that the use of that word was not appropriate or wasn't the best use of or the best word to use. And so I was curious what what you all thought about that. I know it's already been put out in that way, but I was I was curious if there were any thoughts or if that was anything to address on that. No. Tell me more. What's that, Dr. Schwaz? Does anyone have any more about about that objection or? Jennifer, had you received any feedback on that? No, okay. It was at the, um, when we were at Graf Park um, to welcome and celebrate the new DEI director um, and the Crest director. And I used the word to talk about Sunday and um, this community member had said to me that they were uncomfortable with the use of the word and there was a little bit of a dialogue back and forth, but it didn't get much further than that. So, um, all right. So in terms of Saturday's event, Dr. Shabazz, you and I can work on talking if folks are comfortable with, so there's kind of two pieces here. There's deciding if we are comfortable with being sponsors of the Heritage Walk as a body and if providing the meal um, and, 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 and trying to do it in the spirit that Anika brought forward, which I thought uh, that really resonated for me personally. Um, if that is something that we're all in alignment with and in agreement with, and then if so, um, if Hazel's seems like a good starting point in terms of talking to Hazel's to see if they might be available to provide the meal for that day. Uh, I know that Anika is working on getting registrations in so that she has a better sense that's going to come next. So she has a better sense of how many folks will be able to attend. Um, and we'll be there for a meal. And so those are the questions. If there's a yes to the first question of sponsoring and a yes for either way, but a yes then to Hazel's, then we will need to make a request from um, our funds to be able to cover that, to, to truly be, to truly sponsor that piece of things. And so I wanna put that out. We do still have from last year's, I think it was 7,000 that town manager Bachman held for us. We have about half of that left after having paid for the black census. Um, and that's separate from the 206,000 that was put into the account. Dr. Shabazz, were you, you had your hand up? I was going to make a motion. Please. <laughs> I move that the African Heritage Reparations Assembly uh, act as an official sponsor for uh, the um, Heritage Walk being organized by Ancestral Bridges. 
Great. And I second that motion. Um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And I, Alexis, yeah, please. <laughs> well, I'm late, so I missed some things. But I guess I was wondering, is this like, so I, I guess I don't know the registration. Is it like, like people with African heritage who are registering for this meal? I, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I feel like I'm going to be that person who's going to be like, mm, but like, is it, is it, is it because like specifically with this meal, I'm, I'm on board to be um, a sponsor, but I guess I'm wondering is, is one, is there any sort of, um, I don't know, is this, is this making it sort of like a thing of where like the AHRA pays for this meal every year? And then furthermore, is it a meal? Like, are we doing this to support this business? I know this is part of like what they want the event to do, but is this like a part of us supporting a black business or are we doing it to feed black people? Or like, what's, I, I feel like I missed a piece of information there. Uh, uh, Alexis, the sense of my motion was to, just regarding the first part of what uh, our chair had raised, and that is to for us to officially endorse as a body and agree to be listed as a sponsor, uh, a sponsoring entity for the uh, for this walk by ancestral uh, bridges for purposes of promotion, for purposes of helping to get the word out. So I was leaving separately the uh, the question of the meal piece um, that could come as a as a next motion, but I was just trying, the cha our chair had kind of broke it up into two parts. So I was just jumping out with that part for now that we act as a, uh, um, uh, agree here to simply be a sponsor for promotional purposes and for purposes of helping to get the word out. Does that answer that piece of the question? Okay, great. Yvonne, yeah. So are we um, tackling this as separate motions? The sense of my, this motion was just about okay. agreeing to be uh, listed as a sponsor. I think we should be listed as a sponsor, I agree. Okay, so let's vote on that and then let's have a discussion about the second part of things and, and we'll do it that way. Um, okay, so I seconded um, and then we'll start with you, Alexis. Yes. Okay, Hala. Yes. Okay, <laughs> um, Yvonne. Yes. Okay, and Dr. Shabazz. Shabazz, yes. Okay, great. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about um, the meal piece. And so just Alexis, so I can fill you in a little bit. One of the things that uh, Anika and I talked about in our conversation related to how, like what was still needed for this walk? What, what ways could we support um, the, the walk and, and, and learning that there was going to be a meal provided. And I'm gonna pull this up real quick again. Have you seen the map already? Okay. So um, at, the, at the History Museum, there will be a meal provided and Anika really wanted it to be in the spirit of like a family style barbecue feel. Um, and I think, did I get that? Did I get that right? Um, other assembly members? Okay. And so um, it's not gonna be necessarily a sit down, but it's not gonna be a cheese and crackers type of thing. It's, it's going to be a nourishing, it's meant to be a nourishing meal, but in sort of a family barbecue style. Um, and it will be available for anybody who's there, um, who, anybody who comes to the event. And we spoke about the possibility of Hazel's being the vendor for that. Um, I personally have been incredibly um, just in awe of the food and the spirit that goes into the, the food that that Hazel's has been putting out at the events that I've been at. And of course, they're, I think, the only Black-owned restaurant in Amherst. 
if I'm not mistaken, of course, I don't know the identities of all people, but um, so that was a thought and that's as far as really we've gotten. So I'd like to open up the floor um, for us to have a discussion about the meal and if we want to pursue that and uh, how we might pursue that. So my, if I may. Please. Uh, the only thing I was left with, uh, and, and perhaps out of y'all's discussion, you know a little bit more, is just the details of, um, because the way I heard uh, Anika Lopes uh, mentioning it, there's still a little bit of a RSVP or trying to get a number. I can tell you in approaching um, Hazel's or any vendor, the first question is going to be, what is the number I'm, I'm preparing something for? Um, next would then be, what kind of items would you like for me to prepare? And so, you know, so I think that that is uh, one key issue is, is to just have a sense of, of, of the head count, how much you want, you want prepared to have out there. Um, secondly, the, um, the, the uh, kind of, when she raised cookout question, it, it also <clears throat> conjured some things in my mind, are you trying to have it where it's kind of prepared out at where the, the meal would happen or is it something that's just being being brought in and some warmers or in some you know foil foil uh, pans so um it, it i think those are just some of the kinds of logistical questions that that spring to mind but um the uh uh certainly um and, and then finally the other piece is um i'm just looking right now the organizers for the walk is both the Amherst Historical Society and Museum and uh, the new group, new group uh, Ancestral Bridges. But uh, now we've just agreed to be listed as, a, as an endorser or sponsor or supporter. But if there are other um, uh, entities, of course, the whole thing is ending at the Drake. So I'd imagine that perhaps the the bid or the chambers of commerce is is some is, is somewhat supportive or involved in some way. But if we have a, a kind of a comprehensive set of uh, of supporting groups and we're all chipping in, it might not be uh, a very big ask. And then final thing I will say towards something Alexis raised. I don't know if this is projected as an annual event if this is a, a, a kind of one and done for this particular time. Um, so I don't know that we are really making a commitment beyond just this this June 18th um, in terms of uh, if, if we do agree. So I, I think the real question is rather than the specifics of, you know, who's providing or how much is being provided is, is just whether what is our sense of the budget uh, or at least the part of the budget that we could afford to chip in? Could we say out of our 3,500, whatever that's remaining in our account, do we want to say we can put in 500? Do we want to say we can put in a thousand? And then we just kind of leave, you know, leave that offer of that contribution out there in terms of kind of picking up whatever the rest of the, of the deal is. That's, that's my initial thoughts. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. And I will agree. I don't think this is um, meant to be an annual sponsorship. It may happen annually. It may sort of um, evolve over time. But I do think that we're talking about just for this year um, on June 18th. And also, Jennifer, I wanted to check in with you. And I think both Anika and I may have, I, maybe Anika did mention this, but is Cress also sponsoring some portion of Juneteenth, um, or did I get that wrong? Um, they're helping to sponsor the Jubilee on the Common, and okay. I think he's trying to, they're trying to give some type of support to the heritage. I don't know. I wasn't in that conversation with him and Anika. So. Okay. Okay. I have, so I have to get a little clarification on that because I do remember I thought I remembered Crest being a, I wrote it down that Crest was also sponsoring one or the other or both. So just wanted to make sure we might have some linking of arms we can do with Crest and, and see how that 
you know, works as well. Alexis, I thought you were going to raise your hand um, a couple minutes ago. Are you, how are you, <laughs> where are you at? <laughs> I don't know. I think that I, I, I think that what I'm trying to reconcile is just that like this is like something that's already been set up and that we've just been asked to help with it. Um, and I can respect that. Um, but I guess I'm like, a part of me is like, how much of this money is going to white people? And I get that we're paying like a, you know, a black owned business to do it. I don't know. I think that I just need to like process things inside. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. rather than processing them outside. So yeah, I'm just thinking about stuff. Sure. I think these are all really, yeah, absolutely. It's good for us to all be able to do that. Yvonne, I see that your hand is raised. Yeah, I guess my concern mostly is that um, we certainly need to sponsor this event. Um, if we're sponsoring a meal, then I think we should have more details about like who is invited and how it's going to come across and what the purposes of the meal. Is it like to you know, create more, I don't know, are we creating bridges or, you know, like, what is the, what is the point of the meal? I mean, having said that, I mean, we could certainly vote as, you know, unrestricted money to support this and not have to deal with any issue around like a meal. So I guess, so, so my point is if we're going to sponsor a meal, then this should be a reason why we're sponsoring the meal. Mm -hmm. You know, because you could just give them the money and say, do whatever you want with the money. And then they would organize everything and our name would still be on it. But we wouldn't be responsible for anything specific. You know what I mean? Just give it to them unrestricted. But the minute we say we're sponsoring a meal and there should be, a, in my mind anyway, I'm a little bit, you know, I see Alexa shaking her head. I just kind of feel like if we're sponsoring a meal, there should be a reason why we're sponsoring the, the specific, that specific thing. Yeah, I really like, oh, go ahead, please, Alexis. I'm gonna piggyback right on top of that. Like, I think that what I was trying to process was this idea of being invited to the cookout. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, we're not talking about like a sort of theoretical inviting to the cookout, but it's like, so I'm with you, Yvonne. I'm like 100% with you. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like Yvonne clarified what Alexis was also feeling and what I'm hearing, and I can maybe share a little bit more background. So I think um, from Anika's point of view, based on the conversation that I had with her, and being that this is a new event, and it needs a lot of support, especially day of, if anyone was at Juneteenth last year, um, where there was so many wonderful events happening in the Civil War tablets, it takes humans to be there to make sure these things are happening. And I think one area where Anika really felt she needed support was in the meal planning. Like she didn't, she doesn't have currently like support around that. So one way to think of this is I really like what you were thinking, Yvonne, in terms of like offering unrestricted funds, but then as a separate thing, as a volunteer, as a resident of this community or of, as a member of the um, AHRA, if you're available to be able to help that day with the meal and it feels like you're in alignment where you can help organize, I certainly will be there to help doing do that. And I will do that on my own personal kind of just volunteerism, you know? So it doesn't have to be affiliated, like the meal doesn't have to be affiliated necessarily. Um, so we could say we're sponsoring, we're going to, we'd like to make a motion to offer unrestricted funds in X amount, however much we decide. And then just hearing what Anika has said about needing sort of support in terms of the meal, if anybody else is available to work with me um, in that respect, um, that on the day of, or even just helping me to make connections like with Hazel's, um, uh, then we can do that too. So does that, kind of make things a little more pure and cl clear and clean <laughs> it felt for lack of a better way of saying it <laughs> um okay so um before so it sounds like maybe we want to put a motion on the table for unrestricted funds of a certain amount um is are people any comments before we go ahead and do that dr shabazz or hala would you like to 
offer up anything before we do that. And I'll wait a second for you, Hala, to to find the mute button. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no, I'm I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, would somebody like to make the motion and um, and the dollar amount? Yeah. I think before we make a motion, should it, it, do you know what what they need? Um, not exactly. Um, I think that we thought about the meal is what they need from a financial perspective, sort of that's still like, for example, I was very inspired to learn that um, UMass Amherst donated the transportation. So they're providing buses um, to take people to the various um, parts of the walk that may not be able to walk or maybe too hot to walk or whatever the circumstances might be for free. They've provided that as a, a donation, which I thought was really great. So a lot of the things that they have already set in motion have, and that doesn't, I would personally never want to ask a black owned business for a donation <laughs> to do this kind of thing. If we were asking a white business to do, you know, or a non-black owned business to do cheese and crackers, that would be a different thing. But given that it really, that, that what Anika would like to have as the feel for the food and, and the, and what we're doing here, it makes more sense to use a black owned business if possible. Um, so we were going to, uh, Yvonne, kind of get a sense of numbers based on um, a registration that's going to be going out this week. And then, so we still have time, basically, is I guess what I'm saying. We don't have to make this decision today. We can gather some information. And then at our next meeting, um, we'll still, let me just take a look, we'll still have time to be able to discuss and make a final recommendation on that. Can we recommend a, a, a range today and then give you the ability to earmark the funds specifically within that range? That would or be no. most helpful, Yvonne. That would be most helpful. Jennifer, is that is that legit? Can we do that? So I, my guess is because you guys are doing something unrestricted that you guys have a lot more flexibility than anything else. Because typically town, I always run into problems trying to do stuff. So with town <laughs> funds. So. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So um, I just did a little math. And even if it was $25 a person and there were 50 people, that would be $12.50. Um, and I think that's, uh, I don't know, Shabazz, I don't know, you might, you might know more, maybe I'm not being, or someone else in the room, I think that that's not enough. But I think that seeing that we've only got like 3000 something left, that's a good chunk of the money we have left. And I'm not, you know, I think that, you know, we might, we might be able to partially fund this thing. I don't think $500 looking at that maybe that's enough i don't know um picking an amount is hard not knowing like some of what you know agreeing with Chabaz if we don't know how many people or what you know and i do think that if we're gonna if some of this money's getting earmarked for uh or you know it's it'll be unrestricted but if we have a say that it goes towards a black business black owned business i think that that would also i would be good with that too yeah, yeah. Uh, Hala. I'm wondering, I'm, am I misremembering? I think that the money you mentioned is from the previous year. And then this year, I thought our committee was also granted like almost 200,000. Is exactly. that? Okay. Yeah, you got that right. So that um, money from last year, I have to get the exact amount. It's between six and 7,000. We've used a little over three of that for the black census, but we still have the remaining uh, of that money from last year. The 206,000 hasn't been touched at all. And I don't expect that it would be with this. Um, and in addition to that, there's a gift fund that I think people, there may be some contributions that have been made to that. Um, and I have to get an accounting on that. So you are absolutely right, Hala. Just in case Yvonne didn't know, we wouldn't be depleting our whole fundage. 
I, I think the number that you came up with, I'm not sure about like if it's $25 a person or if it's $10 a person or if it's somewhere in between there, it might be more people. And But I do feel like that number is a really good number um, and something that I could su personally support. Um, I don't know what others think about that number though. Would anyone else like to speak to that? So um, for myself, I was looking at it from another direction, not how much would could be donated to help the, the meal cause for, for the June 18th, but I was looking at it from what else I think we might be projecting over the coming months uh, and uh, as we lead up to our, our report that's due a year from now, what are the other expenses? And I and so somewhat in my mind, I was operating from, okay, this is really kind of all, all we have left. But of course, we have also talked about if we did have other expenditures or consultant help or things that did require money, we could make a request to the council to then, you know, transfer out of the stabilization fund. Uh, additional funds to help support that. So with that idea in mind, then I'm a little less, um, I, I guess I could feel a little, a little more generous, but I do think that going down the line, um, if we are talking about a community kind of outreach where we're talking about having some events actually in the AHRA's own, you know, own behalf, to get people out, we might need a little budget just to have some water, if nothing else, some bottled water out there uh, for people to drink uh, uh, that might come out for an hour to discuss reparations, to say nothing about, you know, trying to feed them a meal or anything, but at least have a few bucks for some water. So initially in my mind, I was more like, well, if we could contribute 500, but if, if the spirit of the group is more toward 1200 or 1250 whatever was the quick math that that alexis work out that uh, that i could i could go up in my in my as uh you know in in my regards uh yeah for... that was my quick math and and i wasn't suggesting that amount yeah yeah i was just saying you know if we were thinking about port it would be great for us to know from anika but I'm I'm all for the four the five hundred dollars. I just you know I think that that is a is a you know I'm just wondering who does that. Is that enough? I guess you know is it is it a substantial gift? I'm not sure, and and I think it's hard for us to know without talking to Anika. You know, could anybody refresh me where in the itinerary the meal piece was supposed to happen and yeah. the. I'm going to bring it up just because Alexis also wasn't here when we did that piece. So let me just, and also I could see if Anika um, can either jump back on with us or um, maybe we cut her, cut her loose too quickly. Um, or if she can come back, you know, it would probably be best to do it sooner than later. But to answer your question, um, it's going to be at this right here where I my cursor is the 1245 p.m. When we land there, um, that's where there will be music and lunch being served between that time and the 230 p.m. Is there still a tent there outside the Jones or, or are we talking about just uh, in the in the little garden area or what? This is actually at the History Museum. Right, so there'll be tents out and the fire department will come with their misting machines and having a cooling center. And so things will be, they'll, actually the fire department will go to both days, but they'll, we re just remember last year was really, really hot. And so, um, they're going to have tents, I believe. And yes, the one at the library is still up. Okay. For okay. extra space. So I'm just kind of getting a visual sense of, of where and, and whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, if it's there, that's that's really close and convenient for, for Hazel's as a possible vendor. They're literally just right across the street in terms of uh, uh, bringing things over to support, to support uh, uh, the, the, the food piece. And um, okay, and then from there, 
uh, before everybody gets to itis. It looks like they'd get back, they maybe either those that want to walk could walk right down to Gaylord to the uh, to Hope Church, or they can get on a quick bus ride around the corner <laughs> to, to Hope Church and, uh, and, then, and then get out there and um, uh, be able to see what is, uh, yeah, be able to do the next leg of it. All right, so I'm, I'm getting a kind of a, a, a picture of things then. So some, some good old outdoor food, uh, it sounds like is what's being projected. And um, uh, yeah, so. Um, I think also Dr. Shabazz, um, after 3 p.m. between three and five, yep. it doesn't go from Goodwin immediately to the Drake. People will be invited back to the History Museum. So if there is still food hanging around, there's still gonna be music. So it will, I, I don't believe anything would get wasted is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. I think that the RSVP, um, the register, it's gonna be a free registration, but I know that Anika is trying to get that out and launch the sort of website for this so that at least we'll have some sense of who is registering for the event this week. Um, yes, Yvonne. I was going to say, I, I have a hard stop at four. I okay. just have to go. Um, I'm all for supporting it. I know we kind of went back to talking about, um, about food because we're trying to come up with a dollar amount, but I would say anywhere between five and the $1,200 would I would vote yes for that. Okay. I think I I don't necessarily agree with the twelve hundred dollars. I think that might be higher than we want to to give. And I don't know what the total budget is for this event. Um, we might want to do a little more research and figure out exactly what it is they need and try to support them in a substantial way. I think that you know what I'm saying. I'm I'm trying to figure out if five hundred dollars isn't a substantial enough amount to give them to be. I mean, they'll list us as co-sponsors anyway, or as sponsors anyway, but as the reparations committee supporting Juneteenth, right. I'm trying to figure out what is that amount where we can, you know, kind of, you know, flex our muscles and say, we supported this, you know, $500 may not be it. A thousand dollars might be it, but I don't know. So yeah. Why don't I do this? Why don't, since you have to go, Yvonne, and we need, we have other, a couple other things we have to get to. Um, why don't I try to collect some more information between now and our next meeting, which is um, next Monday, and that's the 13th. And, um, and then we'll be able to make a vote on Monday for a certain amount. Um, and then if Anika is available to come back during that meeting and we need that, we'll ask her to come back and be able to have more discussion with us. Okay. Does that work? That sounds good to me. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. All right. I, <laughs> I know you have to go. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I have another <laughs> call at four. <laughs> That's Bye. okay. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Bye. All right, so we still have a quorum, which is the good news, um, because we do, is everyone still able to be present for like at least the next 10 minutes? Because we have a pretty important item that we need to just cover before we end the meeting. Okay, I see you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, I know Hala's not gonna come to the camera, but Hala, are you still with yes. us? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to do a brief quickly, um, maybe Alexis will come back. I'm going to just, I'm going to do a quick call to uh, public comment, because we do have to do that since we have attendees. Um, so during the public comment period, uh, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, pronouns and residential address. You're welcome to express your views for up to three minutes. Um, and we will not engage in dialogue, but we'll be taking notes and listening. So if you would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand function now and we'll bring you into the room. Okay, so not seeing any. Um, great, look at that timing. <laughs> we just finished public comment and all, Alexa. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so we're going to try to wrap things up, but we do need to cover um, this very important matter that is um, very present for us right now, which is our request uh, to the town council to, de to designate a cannabis tax revenue for our reparations fund. And um, I want to give just like a quick background of where we're at right now with that. Hopefully some of you had a chance to read the packet information and in the email there. We had our presentation at the town council meeting on May 16th. It was referred to the finance committee. Um, during that period of time, I you know, did kind of the things that I do, like having some different dialogues, conversations, trying to research more, um, look into checking what Evanston's doing, what other community, what's happening, just so that I can have the most current information. Um, I had an excellent conversation on Thursday with Jerome Crawford. Jerome is the legal counsel for Pleasantries um, in the, at their corporate level. Um, Pleasantries, if you don't know this, has a cannabis retail operation here in Amherst. Um, Jerome was very much in support of the work that we're doing and um, felt that it did align very well with um, what the cannabis industry overall would like to happen with these, with these uh, monies that are becoming available. So Jerome is going to be um, our closing argument at the June 13th <laughs> town council meeting. He has agreed to come and to speak to this. Um, he's also their director of social and racial equity. So I'm really excited about that and, and, and that he'll be coming. But what's going to happen between now and then is tomorrow there's going to be a finance committee meeting. Oh, I think we lost hollow, which means I've got to pause for a second. Um, let's see. Oh, there she is. Okay. Um, Hala, you're back, right? <laughs> I am. I, I wonder if I should call in. If I drop off again, I'll just call in. But call in. Okay, sorry. great. Internet spotty. So tomorrow, what's going to happen is at three o'clock, there's going to be a discussion at the finance committee about this matter. And the finance committee is going to make a formal recommendation to the town council. And then on June 13th, this will come back for its second discussion with that recommendation from the count from the finance committee, excuse me. Um, and then the town council will take a vote. So bearing that in mind, first would like to know who is able to join tomorrow at the finance committee meeting. I know that Irv will definitely be there. Um, wasn't able to be here today. Hala, you are able to attend? Yes. Excellent. Okay. And how about you, Alexis? Are you available to attend tomorrow at three? I'm, oh, three? I know it's it's a change time. <laughs> oh, yeah. snap. Okay. I'm so glad that you said that because, oh my God. Okay. So I run the meeting. So I'll, I'll be there, but I won't, I'll be there as Amherst Media, but I can, uh, do you want me to like attend separately? I'll just note that you're there. Um, okay. I would like to make sure that I note that you're there, that you're covering the meeting, but you're also there in case questions arise. Or um, And what about you, Dr. Shabazz? Are you available? I hope to be there, yes. Okay, great. So I'm working on a memo right now, and I have not completed the memo um, in time to get it to you all in the packet. There are a couple ways we can go about this. I can share it on the screen right now. Um, and you can give me, you know, the thumbs up or the thumbs down. You can say, run with it. I, I do need to get it, unfortunately, into the packet. Um, but I thought I could go and give you a quick overview. And if there was anything that stands out that's glaring that you want me to remove, or if there's something you want me to add, we can do that. You'll also see in your packet that I created a template that you should feel free to use as members of the assembly to send to anybody you may want to come and make public comment 
or leave a comment. There are three different opportunities there. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and pull, let's see here. I'm not sharing, uh, let's see, share screen and we'll do that and oh that's right this one didn't wasn't coming through was it um here's the template okay can everyone see that so this was in your packet and um basically you could feel free to use it feel free to change it to add language to take language out but it gives you the information on the virtual meeting links for tomorrow's meeting tonight's town council meeting which is a place that anybody would be welcome to make public comment um, about this even though it's not on the agenda tonight the finance committee meeting um, tomorrow and then of course on monday june 13th at that town council meeting i don't have a link for that yet but that's another option for public comment i think it would be really good to hear from members of the black community that do support or black residents that do support this request um, to come to one of these or to use the form here um, and provide a written public comment so please feel free to use this in any way that you all would like. And um, I did, Jennifer wasn't able to open it because I originally sent it in pages. So I'm gonna resend it in a document that you can um, edit. But the memo that is in discussion here is this. Um, so I'm gonna pull it up and I'm just gonna quickly review it here with you. Um, so I start here by um, just really upfront, letting people know what the request was and that the purpose of this memo is to address questions and concerns that came up at the May 16th meeting. I go on to give a little background information about the stabilization fund and the, and the assembly that was formed in June 2021 with links to the approval order and um, to the charge for the assembly. And then I go on to say that the assembly was charged with identifying a plan for developing ongoing funding streams. I talk about a memo here. Um, and now that I've daylighted this, I can send this all, I'll send it to you. Um, it will be in the packet. But there was a memo that uh, the town manager, finance director and comptroller last June wrote uh, that where they made this recommendation to create the stabilization fund to put the $210,000 into it. And also in that memo recommended the adoption of a funding policy to provide ongoing funding to and appropriations from the stabilization fund. So then I go on to say that um, we have to do that now because of the budget cycle and our limited time here in this assembly. And then I go on to, to talk about the concerns that I have heard raised. Um, the first is in relation to earmark or not earmark. Um, it's not been a practice of our town government to earmark. Um, and the reasons to do so is one, because the CCC and the Mass General Law related to cannabis legislation states very clearly that cannabis tax revenue should be earmarked for these purposes, purposes such as reparatory justice. That's not filled in yet, but it will be. I'm also going to talk here about what happened in Evanston last week, if any of you did not catch this. Um, Evanston made 16 benefits, um, reparations of $25,000 each for home down payments and or fixing up a home. And they realized that they have not collected enough in their cannabis tax revenue in order to make those payments. And so the question became, where else do we take the money from? And what their lawyer basically argues is that taking money from the general fund is really not advised because that money is meant to be available for all citizens of a community or all, or all residents of a town. So taking this discretionary money um, is 
it makes the most sense. And so sort of there was a tension around that. And you could look on Evanston Roundtable. That's the um, newspaper in Evanston. And there's a whole write up about it. It's really interesting to follow. But I'm going to fill in with a little bit about that. Um, and then here, another concern we've, we've had is that the plan hasn't been developed yet. Um, there are two things that I want to speak to about that. The first is that the potential buckets, even though we haven't planned anything yet, are we've talked um, and it's sort of known in municipal reparations, I think, to the extent that municipal reparations are known, that there are, are potential housing benefits, business ownership, education. And I'm strategically also adding in here that the CSWG recommendations, including the BIPOC-led Youth Empowerment Center, the Cultural Center, the Community-Wide Healing Process, these are all possible um, community benefits that will come out of our final report. So essentially, the money that we are asking for is being put into a savings account that is going to be reinvested back into the community. So it's very low risk, even though it may seem risky because it's not with the control systems aren't, uh, you know, <laughs> there. Um, but then I will go on to say that there's a process in place that ensures that the initiatives have been vetted by African heritage residents the town attorney, the town council, all appropriations will have to ha have a two thirds vote. So there's plenty of controls in place <laughs> is my, gonna be my point here. There's nothing to you know be overly concerned with just because we haven't developed a, a, in a, you know that we don't have the specifics of a plan yet. And then the last is um, should we, should that AHRA receive 100% of the tax revenue or should there be other um, other ways that, th that this particular money should be used. And here I'm going to talk about um, Evanston's budget so and compare it to our budget and and talk a little bit about how in order for us to do the work we want to do, we need to have a meaningful amount of money to work with, especially because it's set up as an endowment. Um, it doesn't have to be used that way, but that's how it was intended. So the question I have for you all, this is a lot of talking, is first of all, is this memo looking all right to everybody? Is there any glaring red flags that you'd like to call out or anything at all? Um, and also, does it make sense for us to cap what we're looking for from the town out of the cannabis tax revenue? Like if we can assume that there might be other ways that we can get funding, whether we apply for CPA, whether there's grants available to us, whether there are other ways that we might be able to um, develop this fund, it, would it strategically make sense for us to say, we're looking for $200,000, for example, every year out of the cannabis. So if your cannabis goes up to 500, we're looking for 200 every year for 10 years until our fund hits $2 million, for example. Um, and I think that I'd like to get a sense from this committee about that, because this conversation at finance tomorrow and in the town council, I believe, um, that having, if we are able to identify how much we want each year, and if we're able to give a cap amount so that it's not in perpetuity, we might be more successful. Um, but I'm totally open that's just what I've been kind of get, getting, um, but I'm totally open to thought. So I'm going to be quiet now. And <laughs> Jeez. Um, so please, uh, yes, Alexa. Um, okay. I, uh, okay. I guess I want to preface this with like, oh man, I'm definitely going to be looking to you guys in terms of like strategy, because a lot of this feels over my head, but I guess I'm wondering like, I don't know. Is there like no 
sense of irony at all. Like I, I guess I'm frustrated by like, I, I feel like we keep hitting this sort of thing, like, well, the law says this and the law says that. And I'm like, yeah, well, like the law didn't like, according to the law, my family ain't human. So like, there's that piece of it. And then there's also like, like, is there no sense of irony in like black people being like having to ask for money and then white people being like, oh, well, how are you gonna use it? And like, there's no, like there's like that control piece. So I, I don't know, I just feel like there's like no like real sort of like reality situation here like but I, I wonder like is, is this this is this just the game we play and then we just have to be strategic about playing the game so I guess I guess I'm wondering is is well yeah I guess I'm I I, I forgot what I was going to say but it was going to be something about strategy and I guess I'm wondering yeah I, I'm wondering how that goes in terms of like because I I feel like some people forget that like we are creating the wheel in a way and so like we should be able to amend or like change or create new laws. Um, and so I, I feel like people get like, like stuck on that. Um, but, and, and I guess I'm wondering, are, are, is there any way that we can sort of guide them to like, oh yeah. And like, we can sort of be the ones to change that rather than like, it, or, 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 or is there any sort of movement towards that? Or is like, oh, how do we, how do we fit within the rules that we have set up now, even though we ad, acknowledge that the rules and the system is set up to disadvantage these however many people. So I don't know. I feel like that wasn't a comment. Maybe that was just me more venting. I don't know, but thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, I heard that all. <laughs> Uh, would anyone else like to comment either in response to Alexis or just uh, with their own comments? So I'll, I'll ch uh, say a couple of things. Yeah, so first of all, as was noted at the top, this meeting is uh, ultimately archived and live streamed on YouTube. So I think we have to be, um, you know, mindful about our our strategy and our, you know, where where we're coming from on this. My um, essential question, though, uh, Madam Chair, concerns the what is the parameters? What is the scope of what the Finance Committee, as an entity, is charged to weigh in? And, and it's because, to some extent what the document that you've you've highlighted for us in my mind um maybe it's all of that is necessary relative to the finance committee's deliberations to me i just wonder is anybody else on that committee working besides you you know what is the process by which by which they 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 are going to deliberate and arrive at some recommendation to make to, to the council about this, because you seem to be covering a lot of terrain in what, what, you're, what you're putting together there, that it makes me wonder, well, what is the scope of their recommendation? Um, to me, I would think it has to do with thinking about this particular piece out of all of the revenues that the town collects, this relatively new piece of revenue, and 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 whether uh, looking ahead at at the finances of the town and so forth, that to reserve this amount, and I, I get you, there isn't there hasn't been a pattern of doing this, but again, as Alexis says, you know that's life. New new patterns emerge, new things occur, and you have to be thoughtful and open about it. So um, uh, if you want to accomplish certain goals. So for me, then um, it, it would seem to me there the deliberation should be how much, um, what is the financial impact to reserve this piece that, again, people talk about is very erratic. It's based on 
consumer action, consumer action may go very high, consumer action may go very low. People may choose to go to Northampton dispensaries. Of, they can go right down the street to Hadley dispensaries. They're all along Route 9 and opening up on Route 9. So, you know, or conversely, people knowing that this revenue is going for this particular purpose, people may say, rather than go use the, Had the Hadley or the Northampton or whatever dispensaries, maybe I will go to the Amherst dispensaries, understanding that they have made this bold step of reserving this particular set of funds to do something to address the harms that Black folk in this town have historically experienced. So, you know, for me, I just think that um, the, the I, I really am wondering the scope of what the, the Finance Committee is being, is expected to, to really advise the council on because, um, uh, uh, and, and if it's that, look, we can live with carving this, reserving this piece out, and the town won't go into a depression, you know, or the town is not going to fall apart to do that, then, then okay, let's give them, let, you know, I think that's where your Maganos and your, your, your other people need to kind of weigh in to let us, to give us, you know, that to give the committee that data and for the committee to then be able to report that out. I think the real question of the why, the will to do this, that's got to be at the council level. That shouldn't be at the finance committee level. But again, maybe I don't know the, the scope of what they're looking to, to you and Andy and Lynn and all the people on the, on the finance committee. What are y'all really being expected to come back and advise about? So I'll stop there to see if you can give me some feedback on what, what's, what is finance committee trying to, to accomplish for the council here? Yeah, wow, you've raised some really excellent points, Dr. Shabazz, and I really want to raise up the point you made about the statement that the town of Amherst could make and how that could positively, positively impact um, sales at the cannabis um, retail operations we have here in Amherst. I think that is a really powerful point. And given what I know about this community um, and also our, our anchor institutions and folks that may um, think about driving down the street to Hadley or staying here, you know, it, it makes a whole lot of sense that this statement would um, would really gain a lot of support from the people in this community. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, to answer some of your questions, so the Finance Committee, I think, based on the little experience I have, um, does, uh, their recommendation does matter. Um, so, and their recommendation will always come with a, a report. So even if um, we don't have an, a unanimous support, for example, it will be reported to the full town council why that was the case. Um, I think what the finance committee is tasked with doing is looking, as, as you said, at the what is the financial impact um, that this would have. And right now, for really very good reasons, um, there is a sense that this budget is going to be squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. We have four capital projects on the horizon. We've got new two new departments. Um, we've got a lot of in, um, there's a lot of unpredictability in terms of inflation and other aspects. So the sort of carrying narrative right now is that there's a little bit of fear about what's gonna be happening over the next few years. Um, that being said, the town with the recommendation of the finance committee made this commitment last year um, to the fund. And I think that there is a will um, for this fund to be developed and to be developed in a meaningful way. So I, I, I personally think strategically that if we were to be able to be very clear and say this is what we would like from the cannabis money each year up to X amount, um, we would be a lot 
we'd be in a lot better of a position than if we just say we want 100% of cannabis tax revenue um, and we want it in perpetuity and we're not going to even put any limit, you know, like in Evanston, it's up to 10 million. But if you look at their budget, their budget's very different than ours. Um, and so, but even if we don't do that, if we don't put any gui guidelines around it, that's what they'll do. So it's really a matter of, do we want to come in with the strategy and the plan and the guidelines, or do we want to say we want 100% in perpetuity and let them create the guidelines? Um, and so that's kind of like the way I look at it, you know? Um, and it's very possible that the finance committee could vote not to recommend and it gets to the council and it still gets approved. Finance committee is five people there's 13 um, and we need a majority vote. So I'm not gonna speak for anybody, but I'm just gonna say that just numbers wise, it's very possible. So, um, but I think strategically, it would be wonderful if we were able to get to that meeting tomorrow and I was able to really make a solid case for this is what we need every year. Um, if your cannabis money goes up to 300 to 400 to 500, we want 200. We want it over 10 years. We want $2 million in this fund. Maybe you guys have a different number in mind. Maybe it's three, maybe it's one, maybe it's 10. I don't know. But that's the question on the table is like, are you prepared for me to ask for something specific at that finance committee meeting tomorrow? Or do you want to leave it open and let the finance committee let it sort of balance itself out in that way. Um, but, but if I quick follow up. Of course. So I'm still trying to get, is the, the burden all on your shoulders with respect to coming back on that? Or is anybody else reporting in with any other kinds of information relative to this decision-making or is it just, just you and your memo? Thanks for that question. Um, so because of open meeting law, you know, I'm not entirely sure who's going to be bringing what and I could get blindsided, you know, I don't know, I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, but I think that at this point, Sean and Paul are really concerned about the budget. And I think that there is still resistance, I think, around this um, is my sense of things. And not because folks don't want to develop the fund, but because it's just, go ahead, I see did, where- <laughs> did, did, it help it, did it help at all that we've clarified, we're not asking a rework of this budget that they're working on, that for this budget, we understand that cannabis is is in the general is is directed to the general to the general fund um, we're saying that we're talking about a principle for for future budgets going out number one and number two we're saying that coming off the end of each fiscal year that if there is free cash if we didn't go in the red and we finished in the black and there is some free cash try to take close to what the cannabis revenue was, as close as you can get to what the cannabis revenue, and put it in this reparations fund, okay? So for the, for the current year we're in, for the year that's being planned, we're not trying to, we're, we're saying continue your, the practice you started with last year, but for future financial planning, make a decision to reserve this, this piece out. Secondly, to get at your, uh, well, so let me just see if we're on the same. Did that help at all to make that clarification? Very much and very, very much. And I've made that framework very clear to the finance committee with respect to what we'll be discussing tomorrow. So a two-part discussion. One, for this year, continue on with what you've been doing, just like you did last year. And then the second conversation about the policy of designating the cannabis in future years. So yes, absolutely. Same page on that. Um, I, 
I guess the only thing that I wanted to add, um, and thank you for saying all that because it was very helpful for me to understand even how this works. Um, so I guess one thing that I'm thinking of is that I know that the cannabis industry is projected to grow from 28 billion, which was what it was last year, to 197 billion in 2028. And so my thinking is like, like they're gonna continue to get like, I don't know what the graph is gonna look like. I don't know if it's exponential or what, but they're gonna continue to get more and more and more money from the tax revenues, like as time goes on. And I guess I'm wondering like, are we starting to ask them? Like, I, I like the idea of building up to a number, but I guess I'm wondering, like it, it makes it sound like the more that we're able to work with this fund, possibly the more money that we get out of it. Um, and so I guess if, if there's any way to even like, I, I don't know, like how is, is the only way that I guess that we, we sort of like put a stake on a time period is if we say like, we want to build up to this amount of money. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and I think any decision for better or worse can be, it can be reversed or it can be, I mean, any future council, that's another concern by the way, is that what we're asking for is tying the hands of future councils, um, which is not untrue, but my rebuttal to that is any future council can reverse a can reverse a decision by a vote. So there's nothing that's really locked you know, it, it, yeah, okay, if we take money for a school building project and we've made a commitment, a future council probably can't reverse that while we're midway through. Um, there are certain things like that, but mostly anything can be can be changed or reversed. So I think the real question is what framework can folks wrap their minds around right now? Um, and we don't want to give any outs. We don't want to give we don't want to put such an ambiguous thing out there where anything can then, then it goes out of our control. And we're like, so my recommendation is that we're being really clear, like that we, and, and maybe what Dr. Shabazz said, you know, about like, if we're getting to, we're making this case for why cannabis tax revenue should be designated. But like, if we're getting X amount of money per year and it, wherever it comes from, do we care? Um, you know, as long as that commitment is there, maybe we do though, because maybe a future council would then look and be like, well, we don't really have a strong case now. And, and you know, whereas the cannabis piece was so locked in and strong that, you know, so it's so hard to know what might happen. But my feeling is that we should ask for a certain amount each year and we should have a cap. And I know we don't have all of our members here right now, and this is making a decision that's a tough decision, but you know. Um, Let me just raise a different framework. Sure. Um, so again, in the Evanston framework, it's take all that's there up until a certain amount being 10 million. So it's not setting a time frame. You're setting, the, the, the framework you're proposing is let's set a time frame. We'll take a, a whatever comes in or a percentage of what comes in up to 10 years, and then we stop. And, and there, but there is another way, which is to say, let's take what comes in and get to a certain financial goal, be it 2 million, be it 10 million. And you keep taking until you've, you've gotten to that goal. Maybe it comes in, in, in five years, maybe you could achieve that goal in, in 10 years, maybe you don't achieve that goal, you know, until e even more years beyond 10. But it, it just seems to me that's a different framework is to think about if the town is setting sets a goal to create an endowed fund of X amount, and that we take these sources, such as uh, cannabis, such as free cash on, on, on years where you didn't spend all the budget, such as other kind, such as uh, private donations that people might make to the town earmarked to the reparations fund. You could, you could have all of those streams. Now, I think we've got to let people know that in the plan we're developing, we will project 
plans for CPA, but CPA, Community Preservation Act, has a very distinct set of criteria as I read it. And so we can't, you know, there's, there's only so much recreation, only so much, um, uh, uh, um, you know, historic preservation. There's only so much open green space. There's only so much that, you know, can fall under, uh, um, you know, relate to reparative justice for African Americans that that would fit those that criteria. Okay, so, but yes, we will make recommendations in our planning regarding, you know, where we could see funds coming from that, but that's that's a is a recommendation that in some ways isn't even on the council to even deal with that'll be going to that particular committee to to then see if it fits their criteria and they want they want to fund it or or to support it so i just think with respect to the to the council and in respect to these resources um out of the council's budget i get the projection of you know, the tightness of the budget. I get the projection of, you know, the, the all the big projects that are going on and, and the uh, equity and inclusion director uh, ship office and the Cress office and all these things. But again, this is about a distinct project and creating the fund for a distinct project. And the only reason we are trying to grapple with the the planning, the financial planning piece now is that it's all for naught for us to give some bold dreams and ideas of where to spend and go rev up the community about what do you want as repair, and then there's no money. Exactly. There's no financial plan. There's no money. It, it's going to be very disheartening, in my view. So what, what, what can give us the heart and give us the encouragement, and I think, and I'm speaking now within the community, within the African heritage community, what gives us the encouragement to really begin to think about our harms and, and the way in we can repair those harms is that we see the town making the hard decision now to begin to build out a financial resource, resource pool beyond the 200,000 in the stabilization fund now. That they've begun to think about how, and so again, whether it's over, over a 10 year set percentage or if it's over 10 million, you know, up to 10 million, we're trying to build however long it takes to get there. That's just logistics. The real thing is, is that they show that they show and prove the commitment financially to doing a reparative justice pro uh, 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 project. And therefore, I think it will encourage the planning process and of getting the community engaged in coming in to talk about what this might look like, okay? Uh, above and beyond the asks that have happened for youth empowerment centers, for CRESS, for equity inclusion office. That again is all separate. I know it's all expensive in addition to the other big four capital projects and in addition to other deferred maintenance and, 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 and all of this and projections of recession. Climate. Out. I get it, you know, but, but, if, you, but if you make a commitment and it can scale up, it can be what it is now, it can happen, but, but show that you're committing to, a rep, to building out a revenue stream that creates a resource pool from which we can do this work. That's gonna go a long way to helping us get out there into the community and saying to the community, what would make this people of African descent in Amherst really be a part of this community in a way we've never been before. What would be the work? What's the repair? What are the projects? What are the initiatives? Let's list it out. Let's think about it. Let's, let's put our heart into this. If they see that, yeah, okay, they're planning. They're already planning the resources for this. So it's just like 
you know, with with um, the library or the or or the commitment to a new fire station, people get engaged because they say, yeah, decisions have been made. We're going to get a new fire station. Decisions have been made. We're getting a new DPW. We're getting a, 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 a we're we're going to you know have an expanded renovated library. So now people are all at the table on it because they know it's happening. But it's hard to get people at the table on something. And if in the background, they're hearing people say, ah, we don't have money. We're, we're not going to have money. It, everything's too tight. We can't, we can't make any decision about, uh, you know, putting even, you know, this, 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 this piece of money that you didn't even have two years ago. Yeah. That's my, that's my word on it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's exactly what the strategy was in Evanston is they wanted that guarantee first, and then they developed the initiatives for exactly some of the reasons you're talking about. Um, and in our case, we actually don't have time to, this is the only time we have given the budget cycle and when our timing ends, but on a deeper level, and I think what you're really speaking to is, yeah, and no one's going to come to the table for this if they just if they think that this isn't going to be developed in a meaningful way if they think that you know it's going and 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 it's very subjective i think you know amongst counselors on like what each individual counselor feels is a meaningful amount, you know, and what each individual counselor feels um, reparative justice should look like. And even though we know that this is something that the African heritage community should be fully in control of developing, there are still these ideas that folks have. So, um, you know, one, so given that it's 444 right now, I just want to sort of bring us home here to say, what I need to know from you all as the chair and going into this meeting tomorrow is if you would like me to leave our request as open-ended as it is right now, which is that we want 100% cannabis tax revenue in perpetuity, or if you would like me to have a stated goal, X amount of dollars, whether, I think I take your point, Dr. Shabazz, it may, you know, I had sort of set it up like, thinking, okay, we're about 200 um, right now that's been brought in. Um, we can open up three more retail establishments as I understand it. So that number should grow based on what Alexa said, that number should grow. The other side to that is we've got a lot of competition around here um, as Dr. Shabazz pointed out. Um, and people grow marijuana around here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, but they do. Um, so I think that there are a lot of forces and factors. By the way, you should also know there's a movement um, to do away with the community impact fees that cannabis retailers were responsible for because um, it's sort of become known that they're aren't very many negative impacts like there, like it was thought there would be. And so why are we taking money out of these startups um, and making them pay this fee when there isn't even real impacts to be talked about here? Um, although I would make a case that the impact money could go toward things like Cress um, because we're talking about um, potentially diversion programs and different things that you know, um, that would fit into that category. But the question I, I, I really have right now is, would you like me to take this into the finance committee tomorrow open-ended, or would you like me to come in and say, listen, this is our goal. We want this fund to grow to whatever amount. Um, and let's figure out a way to get there together. We want you to designate the cannabis tax revenue. If, if, you know, if you've got some other way of doing it, but we want a commitment on our goal, you know, or so that's what I'm looking for right now. I'll say quickly from my end, um, I think we'd be moving a little quick to, to kind of close in a vision on this okay. right now. We haven't brought it up before back in October. I, I threw my vision out there already. The CPA model is what I envision. How do we build an endowment? let's say $10 million that would then generate like 40 to 50,000 a year, okay? That could go toward whatever a, a designated body said, this is what we wanna spend 
uh, that comes from the community. Somebody could get burned out of their house. Somebody could have, you know, being evicted. Somebody, whatever the issues are, there's this fund. It generates a certain amount of interest every year, and it's there to be used for the projects as they come in. That's been my view. Like the CPA model, how to get there is what we've been trying to look at. Nobody's talked about trying to put, in the case of uh, uh, the CPA, it's three cents on the dollar. It's a designated percentage out of taxes, okay? So uh, uh, sales or whatever, property tax, whatever it is, it's a designated percentage out of it that then gets even a matching amount from the state. We don't have all that set up here, but that's been my mind, is how could we develop a resource pool, build out an endowment, and then live off of the interest, fund projects off of the interest from that, uh, from, from, from that pool. So that's how I saw cannabis streams, other streams could go in and flow to build up that fund. But that's just me. We haven't voted that. We haven't decided on that. So I don't expect you to carry that into a meeting, mm -hmm. no more than I would say carry into the meeting, you know, we only want cannabis for for the next uh, um, you know ten years or for the you know at at twenty five percent of cannabis revenue. I just don't know that that we we can calculate that out right at this right at this minute. And and I'd like to see from their end if the, if what is the imperative to calculate that out. Uh, number one, because if they're saying the budget is so restricted and the financial projections are so gloom and doom in Amherst that we can't see living without, again, an amorphous amount, because you don't know if it's going up, you don't know if it's going down, you don't know how much it's going up. That's all voodoo economics to try to project that. It's all voodoo economics. I could sit here and tell you, if we made a bold statement in Amherst that the funds are going to go toward this that will help Black people, that could even help diversion programs, that could even help something Cress is doing that's beyond the scope of its budget, and they would put in a proposal to the Reparative Justice Fund, look, next year we need 30000 to help youth that have that have uh, uh, gotten busted to you know for the diversion work. We, we the the group deciding this might say, yeah, that's a great use of reparative justice funds. Let's support that to or, or to give some scholarships to black to black youth that are that are coming out of uh, 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 jail or whatever. It's all open. So so yeah, I just think that the real question, the economic question, I see is. How dire can, is the is the town trying to say we our finances are that this revenue of stream that again you don't even know where it's going cannot you can't live without it or you can't live you know begin to to think about living without it over the next uh, um, you know up up to uh, where it generates X amount of money or or in your case. Uh, Madam Chair, over the next 10 years, you know, you can't see living without it. And again, understanding, we're talking about putting the money away. Right. And that means it's not being spent, the, pre the principal's not being spent. So if there was a financial doom, yes, that same council that said, let's squirrel it away, could say, let's repurpose it because we're in a depression and we need this now. And we'll try to come back to it later once we get through this tight period where it, you could do, you can make all those decisions. The money isn't lost. The point is the statement you make by committing to, by committing to create the funds, to create the funding, the, the pool of resources. That to me is the real question that's in the balance for, for um, uh, other than if, if the finance committee has some information coming in saying that it, that every penny coming in is is can you, you're not going to be able to live without it because we're going to be in such such deep economic despair. If that's the case, well, I'll, I'll be listening to the meeting tomorrow to hear. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, and you know, I I'm, it's frustrating because 
I wish that in my experience, the discussions aren't able to be as deep as what we're talking here and aren't able to be as sort of um, like what you're describing is like a sentiment. It's a, it's, it's a, um, you know, and, and what the finance committee does, does, does is like a yes or no thing. <laughs> so it's like a way different um, approach um, but I think what you're saying is to come into the meeting and carry the sentiment that you're describing and that I will do in the best possible way and you'll hopefully all be there um, to be able to support that. Um, I know that Andy, who is the chair of the finance committee, has made it clear to me that there is not a ton of time for this. And this is sort of always the way it goes, um, because there are several other things on the agenda. Um, and we will still have that time at the June 13th meeting where this is ultimately decided. Um, so I, I think that, you know, what I'm hearing you say is let's go in with what we've already asked for. Let's not put any limitations. Let's have a conversation about working together to develop this fund in a meaningful way um, and, and sort of that's it. And seeing what comes. <laughs> Is that Alexis and, and Hala? Are you on board with that? Or would you like to add anything or? I'm on board with that. Okay. Thanks, Hala. You too, Alexis? Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can always reach out to me and Jennifer, just don't write anything that's to everybody, please. Um, if needed, please, you know, you can reach out to me, to, to me and Jennifer. And um, so let me just make sure, I just want to check my agenda because it's getting late here. Um, the, the AHRA meeting has been posted for tomorrow. I sent you all the agenda. So you'll just want to use that link Unless were you sent, did you get a panelist invite? Jennifer, do you know if panelist invites are going for tomorrow's finance meeting or should they just enter? Um, if you would like them to, then you should send that information over to Athena. I think that's what she said in the email. Otherwise okay. she'll just pull them. Okay. I think we'll just- We're not, we're, we're not presenters though, right? No, but I want you in the room. If you don't, you know, I'd like you to be in the discussion. Um, we're not really going to be presenting much. They'll see the memo that I wrote, but really it's going to be for those committee members, including myself, because I happen to be one, to have a conversation about this. Um, and for you all to be there for that discussion. I, I am going to try to frame it as much as possible for it to be a discussion. And I do think Andy feels similarly, um, but we just have a time constraint. And I know that's always going to be, you know, the issue. So um, why don't you all just use the link there instead of me putting another thing on Athena's plate and we'll make sure that everybody gets brought in um, if that works. And Alexis, I know you'll be um, you'll be there um, and feel free to open a second lap, like a second computer and come in if you want. <laughs> um, all right. This uh, has been a great meeting um, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to go so I can prepare for the next meeting, um, but we are meeting next week, same time, three o'clock, I'll send out agendas. Um, thanks, thanks so much to all of you, just really appreciate this work that we were able to do together. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, okay? All right, meeting adjourned at 4.56, Jennifer. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>